Hello, this is Michael Moore. This is my podcast, Rumble with Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad to speak to you. It's uh, What do we got? Just about a week here before Christmas, two weeks before New Year's. This past week, the Republicans in the House of Representatives passed a motion to begin the investigation for the impeachment of President Joe Biden. It was mostly treated probably the way it should have been in the press and amongst the public as just another piece of proof of the lunacy of the Republican Party. All the press asking all the Republicans this week in Congress, so why are you impeaching him? What did he do? What was the crime? Oh, we don't know. We're going to find out the crime. <laughs> uh, but you don't, like, charge somebody unless you've got an idea, at least, if they've committed a, an offense, a crime, high crimes and misdemeanors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we gotta, we're going to start the impeachment first, and we believe that in the process of the impeachment, we will discover bad things that Joe Biden has done. <laughs> wow. I don't know. It's been a really crazy week, sad week again, two months in a row of this. President Biden realizing that he's certainly on the wrong side of where the American people are at when it comes to committing war crimes and slaughter of civilians. The American people, really most of the people around the world. Last weekend at the UN, there was a vote on whether or not to appeal to Israel for a ceasefire. So let's go back to this pause. You know, we got 100 hostages out during that last pause. Let's stop killing everybody. And 153 countries voted for the ceasefire. Nine or 10 voted for no ceasefire, and the United States was all set again to veto the resolution that the vast majority of nations were saying that this is wrong, what we're doing is wrong. What Hamas did on October 7th was worse than wrong. It was absolute horror and terror. And so good people, said that then, spoke out against it then. But uh, the prime minister of Israel and his uh, cronies decided to take advantage of the opportunity to kill a lot of Palestinians. Not because the Palestinians were still coming across the border on the 8th and the 9th and the 10th with more massacring of, of civilians in Israel. They did that, and then they skedaddled a lot of there with their hostages. But... It embarrassed the Israeli government, obviously. Their job is to protect the people, and they didn't do that. In fact, people huddled in underground shelters and safe rooms for hours upon hours upon hours on October 7th, hoping that their government, their army, their police would come to save them. And it was... (sighs) 8, 10, 12, 15 hours. How could that be? This is such a tiny, tiny area with a massive military force. And a week or two before that, they, I don't know, they said they needed them up on the Lebanese border and they needed them to help the settlers in the West Bank because they were busy killing Palestinians, taking their land. Hmm. I don't know. It's just all such, such so wrong. We're the bank for all this, you and I. We fund the whole damn thing. And there's still about 130 hostages that have not been recovered. The Israeli army, in case anybody was needing any proof that they were there to just kill about anything that moves in Gaza, And if you said anything like that since uh, October 14th or whatever, whenever uh, the invasion started, the bombing started before that, but, you know, there's been a mass slaughter, as you know, of these Palestinian civilians, children, babies, old people. And so if you've said anything to your friends or at work or in the neighborhood, this doesn't seem right. At this point, they've, what, killed over 18,000 Palestinians? 
somewhere between a third to half of those are children. So if you said during this these last few weeks, boy, that just seems like they're trying to shoot any Palestinian on sight. And then if anybody disagreed with that and said, no, 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 you shouldn't, you can't say that. That's a lie that's wrong and it's anti-Semitic, it's anti-Israel, it's anti, you know, whatever they, whatever name they want to call you. But I guess we needed no further proof than a few days ago when the Israeli army, all of a sudden three of the hostages apparently had escaped and found some Israeli soldiers, but were worried because they'd all been in the Israeli army at some point, so they know what's going to happen to them uh, because they look, well, they're Jewish, but, you know, a lot of Jewish people in Israel look like Palestinians, and Palestinians look like Israelis, and if you've been there, you already know that. Unless they're wearing some sort of religious garb or an Israeli uniform, you would don't know. I mean, they just they could be either. So they knew that. That's why they took their shirts off. They stripped their shirts off so that the Israeli soldiers could see they weren't carrying any guns or weapons or a bomb or whatever. And they they came out of the building that they were hiding in from Hamas because they'd escaped, waving a white flag. These are three Israelis waving a white flag as they come toward the Israeli soldiers with their hands up, their shirts off, and immediately an Israeli sniper shoots two of them dead, just flat out blew them away. And the third guy sees this and goes, holy shit. And he runs back into the building to hide and he's screaming out. He's still waving the white flag and he's screaming out in Hebrew, you know, I'm an Israeli. I'm an Israeli. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. And the army guys, Israeli army guys, just went right into that building, sought him out, found him, blew him away while he's screaming in Hebrew, I'm a Jew. Don't shoot me, please. Wow. Clearly, certain members of the army have been told, if you see something, shoot something. If it's a man in his 20s, like these three young men were, skin's a little dark, beard's a little black, blow them away. Ask questions later. Now, of course, the Israeli population is in the streets again, protesting this. They get it now. They get it that Netanyahu has had the survival of the hostages somewhere down at number three or four, if they're on his list of priorities right now. Do you remember back when the first two elderly women were released, Israeli women, by Hamas, maybe a month into this? And when, you know, the Israeli press, the, especially the investigative press, especially a lot of the Hebrew presses there, reported that Netanyahu and his more right-wing cronies said that uh, this is not good, not good for us. They're going to release all these hostages. We're going to lose part of the excuse we have for going in and killing Palestinians on site. They thought that was a bad thing that night. And so the next night, the Hamas wanted to release two more Israelis. And uh, Netanyahu's people, they were trying to negotiate this with the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. And they were like, no, 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 we're not, we're not taking any more from you. And it was like this weird back and forth. And Hamas was like, wait a minute, you don't want your, these hostages back? No, we want them back, but we're going to kill you first, and then we'll take them back. Kind of an odd way to save grandma, isn't it? You know, somebody has kidnapped grandma and is holding grandma. So what should we do? Hmm. Oh, I know. Let's tell them we're coming in now into the hood and we're going to kill all of you who are holding the hostages and then we'll take the hostages back. How's that going to work? They start carpet bombing the civilian population, bombing the very locations where the hostages are being held. 
Actually, they think now that well over 20 of the hostages have been killed through various means that they either won't admit to now or haven't figured out the what-what of it all. But nobody believes that Hamas is executing hostages. I mean, that's their leverage. They're not going to give up the leverage by killing them. So these 20-plus hostages have died from this indiscriminate bombing. Tanks, guns, snipers, shooting at everything, including at Israelis who are running from Hamas, hostages who are held, waving a white flag, no shirt on, no weapons, no nothing, and speaking, shouting only in Hebrew. This is so sad. And President Biden, what are you doing? I think you know now that you've kind of messed this up. That speech you gave here, middle of the week, end of the week, warning Israel to stop it, to stop this crazy bombing and slaughter, slow it down. You have to do specific targeting of people you believe killed people on October 7th. You're not doing that. You tell the people who live in the north, the Palestinians, get on the road and head south, and then you strafe them on the road with your planes and kill them. When they get to the south, then you start bombing the south. You don't have to be any kind of a war analyst or rocket scientist to understand exactly what the Israelis are doing. Kill, kill, kill. You killed us, we kill you. I mean, I guess most people wouldn't disagree with that if the you kill us, we kill you part is if you keep killing us, if you're killing, if you're in the act of killing us right now, we have a right to our self-defense and we're going to stop you from killing us. Most people get that, I think. But if there's no raids happening, no raids into southern Israel, what's the point of just carpet bombing the civilian population of one of the most densely packed areas of human beings in the world? It's just madness. And I don't know what to say or do to stop it other than to say to my elected representatives, I don't want you using my money or any American's money to fund this. Stop it. President Biden has only gone down in the polls since this started. And I know lots of people, friends of mine, They're frightened. I'm talking about Jewish friends. They're frightened because they always believed they had a safe place there in Israel. And when they learned that their own government wouldn't protect them, their own they weren't safe from their own government. And then their own government, when it goes into Gaza, kills Israeli citizens who are begging in Hebrew, please don't kill me. And they always have an answer for this when they try to explain it, when the generals go up to the microphone. Well, that's because these Palestinians, dot, 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 they, these people, you know, they, they hide behind civilians. They, they make stuff up. They try to pretend to be Jewish. There's some trick always going on. They're hiding the hostages, you know, behind civilians. They're in schools. They're in hospitals. I mean, we've just listened to this. BS, one lie after another. I'm sorry to just have to call it for what it is. But everybody now, I don't, I don't know why am I, I'm not sorry. I mean, I mean, dear Israeli government, do you understand that I know we look a little slow sometimes as Americans, but we're not stupid. And when you start saying stuff like this and, oh yeah, oh no, no, that was a Pal Palestinians accidentally bombed their own hospital. If you start that stuff up, 
And then you all of a sudden you have this quickie investigation to prove and you lay out some old guns, some old AK-47s that are all rusted. And this is what we found in the hospital. <laughs> you know, nobody believes you. This is how bad it's gotten. How sad it's gotten. You know, you can pump all this stuff on TV all you want every day telling us that there's this huge rise in anti-Semitism in this country. And we have to fire these college presidents and all this other stuff. Yes, there is anti-Semitism, believe you me. This country is full of people who hate Jews and it's been that way for a long time. But that is not who the bulk of American people are. American people do not feel this way. American people have supported Israel from the very beginning. The guilt that Americans felt that we didn't come to the Jewish people's aid in Europe when it mattered. There's that great line, I think I've quoted it before from the Ken Burns documentary last year on the US and the Holocaust. And when they get to the D-Day part of World War II, like in, I don't know, the second or third episode, he says this line, he says, of the six million Jews who were killed in World War II, five million were already dead before the first American boots hit Omaha Beach on D-Day. Halfway through 1944, just, mm, what, nine months, 10 months before the defeat of the Germans in World War II? That's all that was left of the war. They had already killed five of the six million All the Jews who tried to escape here, to Britain, to every place they could try it on boats and nobody would let them dock. And so a lot of them just had to go back home and were executed then. And you know what's another thing too, there's this Pew Research poll that takes place every couple of years. They do a favorability rating on religion. They ask the American people, which uh, religion do you have the best feelings about? They are the you like the most, not the one that you believe in or the one you belong to, but they're just trying to do a favorability rating. That's all it is. Just like when they, you know, here's Trump's favorability rating, here's Biden's. What's the favorability rating for Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists. So every couple of years they conduct this poll. I think, I think for like the last at least maybe four, is it four years or four polls, when they've asked this question, the religion that has come in each time at number one, in other words, the religion in the United States that has the highest favorability ratings is Judaism. That's just the average American people, thousands of them being polled by the Pew Research Center. Number one favorite religion, even though Jews make up only 2% of the American population, they come in at number one in each of these polls. With the average Americans just saying, well, I'm... I like the Jews the best, actually. Sorry for the people trying to whip up an opposite narrative here, but that's the America we live in. 10% of the United States Senate are Jewish men or women. 10% Jewish, the United States Senate, 2% of the population. So in other words, a lot of non-Jews are voting for Jews to represent them in the United States Senate. And I'm not just talking about in New York or you know places that do have maybe a higher concentration of Jewish citizens. I'm talking about in the last, I don't know, three decades or so. I mean, big Jewish states like Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, states like that have actually sent, they've, had, they've sent two Jews. They have, both US senators are Jewish. Michigan, Senator Carl Levin. Ohio, Senator uh, Metzenbaum. I mean, 
You, you, Oregon has had two Jewish senators during this time. And on and on. And now Georgia. Georgia is represented by a black man and a Jewish man. That's the country we live in. And you're saying, this is Georgia? How did this happen? Because we've changed. America is better on some levels. And you shouldn't be afraid to say that. It's the truth. Take a bow. It's are we where we need to be? No. No, we've taken away some serious rights from the majority of the population, women. The next thing they want to do is they want to get rid of same-sex marriage. I mean, they got a whole list. They're, they're going to try to get rid of birth control, trying to get rid of the abortion pill. You know, we're not in, <laughs> we're nowhere near great shape. But don't try to feed people's brains with stuff to make it look like we need to support the slaughter of Palestinians because you've had to suffer here because America is such a hateful, anti-Semitic place. It is hateful. It is filled with anti-Semitism. And 10% of the country wants their United States Senate to be run by Jewish men and women. 2% of the population Jews are, and yet 10% of our Senate. Georgia, they want a Jewish man representing them. That's their voice in the U.S. Senate. And their other voice is a black man. Just the facts. I don't, I'm... I don't know. Before I uh, continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank the underwriters of this week's episode of Rumble with Michael Moore. First up, uh, this episode is brought to you by a longtime supporter of this podcast, and that is BetterHelp. It's the season of giving my friends, and while giving to others, whether giving your time or your love or actual presence, this can certainly bring joy. But remember to give yourself some love and attention this holiday season too. Because the truth is, for some of us, this can be a very difficult time of the year. And it can be stressful. And in some cases, sad. So be sure to take some time for you and to go easy on yourself. If you need someone to talk to and you've been thinking about maybe starting therapy, look into BetterHelp. It's entirely online, which means it's flexible to fit into your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and they will match you with a licensed therapist. And if the therapist isn't a great fit for you, you can switch. Switch therapists at any time, no additional charge. So in the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash rumble. Do it today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash rumble and also a huge thank you to Babel. winter is here my friends and the time of the year to burrow in is upon us making it the perfect time to pick up a new hobby like learning a new language that's where Babel comes in with Babel, you start speaking a new language in just three weeks I mean, think about that. If you start now, by the second week in January, you can be having casual conversations in Italian or German or Indonesian. Why Babbel? Because it works. Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. Developed by over 150 expert linguists, Babbel gives you unlimited access to hundreds of award-winning lessons designed for all learners based on level and time commitment. All of Babbel's tips and tools for learning a new language are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching. With over 10 million subscriptions sold, Babbel is helping millions of people quickly and confidently have real-world conversations in a new language. 
So here's a special deal for all of our listeners. Then you can get started right now learning a new language. You get 55% off your Babbel subscription. But this is only for my listeners on this podcast. So uh, you just go to babbel.com slash rumble. Put the rumble in there so you can get that 55% off. 55% off at babbel.com. And Babbel is B-A-B-B-E-L. B-A-B-B-E-L. Babbel.com slash rumble. And you get 55% off by putting rumble in there. Rules and restrictions may apply. Okay. Anyways, um, the Republicans want to impeach Biden this week. Jeez. Are we just living in just a whacked out situation here? I mean, I... <sighs> so 25 years ago tonight, I got my first invitation to a White House dinner. Bill Clinton was president. 1998. And it was a White House dinner uh basically to be in support of a special olympics um but it was you know one of those affairs where you know i had to get a tuxedo and you know black tie event and so i went i i i made it through security <laughs> and uh it was uh you know i i think i maybe have talked about this a couple years ago being in line there and you have to go through the line and the president and the first lady greet you and Bill grabs my hand and says, I'm, I'm, one of your, I'm one of your biggest fans, Michael Moore. I can't believe it. <laughs> and, and then right away, Hillary hears this and grabs my hand away from Bill and takes it and squeezes it and said, no, you're not. I'm his biggest fan. And then they both have kind of like a, I don't know what this was. It was kind of like he remembered uh, some scene from Roger and me. She remembered some episode from my uh, my show on NBC, TV Nation. I mean, it was like, wow. It was like being, it was like a ping pong game. I don't know. Yeah, but then, then I, I remember he did this and it was like, I, I couldn't believe it. That How do you get away with this? Let's just say my first thought was, boy, you know, people had talked about how really kind of smart both of these people were, Bill and Hillary. And they were really good at politics. And um, the, the I mean, there's there's got to be 200 people at this White House dinner. Are they quoting lyrics from songs of the guy for Blues Traveler who was standing in line, in line in front of me. I mean, it was that sort of thing, you know. And the guy behind me was the was the chairman of General Electric. I mean, it was just kind of that weird thing. And I'm like kind of there. So about, I don't know, halfway through the dinner, when the entertainment started, I got up to go out to the... Now, the dinner was under a big tent on the lawn behind the uh, the south lawn of the White House. And so uh, they have porta johns, but really fancy porta johns. But so they don't want people going in the White House because they're already outside. So I go into one of the porta johns, and it's got like a wall, you know, one of those, or it's like there's a set of urinals on one side and on the other side. And there's very nice faucets with, you know, kind of fake crystal handles and whatever. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I'll try to keep this to, you know, away from TMI. But I'm peeing, and um, I hear a flush on the other side of the wall. And you can hear the faucet go. So he's washing his hands. That's a good sign. And then I flush, and on my side of the wall, I do the same thing. And then we both walk out of the door of this kind of mega porta john And I look over at the door right next to me, coming out of the door, is... President Bill Clinton. Now, what you need to know at this point is, is that in about maybe 
10 to 12 hours, the House of Representatives is going to vote on whether or not to impeach Bill Clinton. So this is the night before the impeachment. And I have to say, and I don't think I'm projecting anything here, but he did not look good. He did not, his eyes were puffy. His, his, uh, he had, it's a lot of makeup on. And I, and he goes, oh, Michael Moore. And he was like, you know, and he holds out his hand to shake my hand, but I'd, I'd heard the faucet running. So I know he washed, I washed it, you know, so we're all good. I shake his hand again and, and I, and I noticed that he just, uh, hmm. Looks like a guy that might get impeached in the morning. So I said to him, I said, you know, um, just want to tell you I feel bad what you're going through here. And and then I just said the first thing that came into my head. And then, you know, and I've been very critical of him. I'd done lots of things on my TV show that were not necessarily favorable to him. And um, I said to him, I said, you know, it's fairly rare that a person becomes president of the United States when they're from the working class. You know, but that's, you know, that's who you are. Your mother was a nurse. She was a single mom. She had to work a lot of night shifts as the nurse in the hospital. And so you were left alone, but she had to make do with what she had. That you would become president of the United States coming from such a, you know, meager background in the sense of uh, you didn't have money. Don't think that isn't lost on all the rest of us who came from the working class. And while we may have our disagreements, there's a certain pride that one of us actually ended up in the White House. And he's looking at me while I'm saying this, and there's like, um, he's kind of tearing up a little bit. It could have just been that he's about 10 hours away from being impeached. I, I don't want to take the credit for that, but I'm just saying. He goes, well, that was very, very nice of you to say that. And I said, well, it's just the truth. I think if you just maybe tomorrow hang on to that thought and remember that when you're through this, you know, we the people, we the that grew up in the Flint, Michigans, and the Gary, Indianas, and the uh, the mill towns of New England and North Carolina. Uh, we need you. We need you to do the right thing. And, well, th uh, thank you. Thank. Uh, I will. I will. I will keep that in mind. And then he pivots very quickly, and somebody's walking by that's going to help run. Al Gore's campaign for president the next year. Oh, my, Michael Moore, I want, I want you to meet the... And, and so he's like introducing me to this, you know, campaign leader, dude. I really think it, you, you should two should get together and uh, Michael, I'm sure, can can help out uh, Vice President Gore. And, and <laughs> so, and that was, that was the end of that. And I'm stood and talked to the campaign guy for a little bit. All this came together because of this. Now they've started this impeachment of Joe Biden. And and what are we doing with a Democrat in the White House? Somebody, as I've told you before, I supported Bernie. I campaigned for Bernie over, I don't know, four month period back at the 20 election. And then when Bernie didn't make it, I did whatever I could to help Biden. And I've been a strong supporter of a lot of the good that he has done in the ways that he has stood up for working people and for the poor. Not the way I would have done it, but nonetheless, I just, I do believe giving subcredit where credit is due. And yet, we have a Democrat funding a war. Not really a war. If there was a war, there would be fighter planes on each side and battleships and, you know, real troops. You know, one side has got an atomic bomb and the other side has kites. 
So I don't know what you call that, but the slaughter has to stop. We have to understand what it would feel like if any of us were trapped for 17 years in an outdoor prison with little electricity, little available drinking water, trapped, not allowed to leave, no airport to fly out of, no ferry boat to take. And now, whatever the plan is here, the vast majority of the population, nearly 2 million people, are not in their homes. Their homes have been leveled. They can't get the basic necessities uh, to get through. And uh, Biden says that they shouldn't be slaughtered like that and they shouldn't be treated like that, but then nothing seems to really happen. And he seems to be getting angrier and angrier at Netanyahu not doing the right thing for violating international law, for committing war crimes, all the stuff. Just say it, Joe. That's what he's doing. He's doing it with our money. You have a lot more control in this thing. Yes, you can promise him all you want that you would do a better job of protecting his people than he has. I don't think anybody would fault you for that, but not this way. Not doing it this way. Well, we know the impeachment thing won't go anywhere, as it shouldn't. But you, President Biden, you went to mass today. I would love to hear how you square that. You're paying for this. You're paying for virtually all of this. And if you have an answer, as to how you go to mass with this kind of blood on your hands? I'm all ears. Seriously, if you want to track me down, I think they know where I am. <laughs> um, call me and tell me. If you say this has to be private, I'll keep it private. Just between one Catholic and one recovering Catholic. Tell me, how do you square this? How much longer are you going to let it go on? This country has supported Israel from the beginning. This country was trying to and continues to try to make up for and to receive some redemption for the awful way that we behaved in the 30s and the early 40s when we could have really helped Jewish Men, women, kids survive and didn't. So don't be confused by all this. The majority of Americans, according to these polls that are taken by a reputable polling firm, the Pew Research Center, the majority of Americans, the highest favorability rating goes to Judaism. Ninety-eight percent of the country is not Jewish, and yet the majority believe that that, I think, sounds like the best religion, even if they don't believe in it. That's who we are, though. That's why every state that's had a ballot measure since uh, the Supreme Court got rid of Roe v. Wade, including every red state that's had a ballot measure, has voted in favor of legal abortion in the last year and a half. That right is going to be returned. There's lots of other things that are going to happen in the next year or so. Trump is not going back in the Oval Office. That's not happening. And I'm not just saying that because I'm deluded or because I'm not concerned. I am very concerned. It'll happen if people don't show up. It'll happen if the President of the United States supports a war like this, a slaughter like this, and young people say, oh, I don't want any part of this, and then they don't vote. That's how you lose an election from the people that don't vote. 
Nobody's switching their vote from Biden to Trump. But you're providing cover for a, what now, three times indicted felony indictment prime minister of Israel still awaiting trial for his felony crimes of fraud, bribery, other malfeasance here in his government. Nobody's talking about that now. Because we have to, we have to fight and kill and stop them, remove them. What does his defense minister call the Palestinians? Animals? Yeah. Well, I have stronger language than that for the people that committed the slaughter in Israel on October 7th. But this is not how you end that kind of violence. By doing 10 times that kind of violence to the civilian people who live on the other side of that fence. The hostages waved a white flag. They pleaded in Hebrew to the Israeli soldiers, please don't kill me. Their shirts were off so the Israelis could see that there were no weapons and no bombs. And it didn't mean squat. Because the order, the order clearly for two months has been, kill them all, drop the bombs, strafe the streets. And if he looks like he might be Palestinian, shirt or no shirt, white flag or no white flag, end his life. Anybody listening to me right now want to keep funding that? Anybody want to contribute another $10 to that? Another $10,000 to that? If you do, be sure and call your member of Congress tomorrow and say, more killing, please. But if you don't, and you don't speak up, and you don't call your members of Congress and your senators, your silence, my silence, is violence. It means we agree. And someday we'll have to answer for this. And I don't want to answer for what's being done in my name. I want this to end now. I want the United States to stop vetoing peace resolutions in the United Nations. I want to have a pause to give the Israeli people a chance to have elections. 82% want him gone, Netanyahu. I want them to have that election. Now, now, remove him and his gang. Put the criminals on trial as you already had started to do just weeks before that massacre on October 7th. A white flag. A white flag. This was not an accident. This was the policy, the Netanyahu policy, funded by President Biden. Let's all of us do our part here today, tomorrow. Please make your voice heard. If you support uh, the survival of Israel, it's the best thing you can do to help people who maybe have gone just a little whatever themselves because they've never had to suffer through a slaughter like the one on October 7th. And so they're out of their minds a bit. You can understand that. You know, we invaded two countries that 
did not fly planes into the World Trade Center or the Pentagon. So, not pointing the finger here. I'll always point it at ourselves. We're the originators of death and destruction like that. Please, don't follow our lead. As Biden said this week to the Israelis, you're losing the support of the world. And it's not, not an answer for you to say, well, of course we are, we're, you know, we're Jewish, everybody hates us. Well, yes, I'm sorry for that. There's a lot of hatred and it's incumbent upon all of us who are not Jewish to stand up for you, to always have your back, to never let harm come to you because you're Jewish. That is our responsibility. We have failed in the past. You have suffered as a result of that in the past. And I don't want anybody on my team um, who uh, won't say what I just said. That is our responsibility. But we don't just say that to Israelis who have been harmed. We say it to any oppressed group of people who have been harmed. And right now, there is a mass oppression, a mass taking of life by the Israeli government against the Palestinian people. Stop, 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 enough. Thanks for listening to this. I have so many feelings about this every day. I I think about this, I feel, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? I know a lot of you are feeling the same thing. Let's try no more death, no more mass destruction. All hostages released. We were well on our way to that. A hundred released? Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. The next morning, the United States House of Representatives voted to impeach Bill Clinton. It's a crazy world. Take care, everyone. This is Michael Moore. This is Rumble with Michael Moore. My thanks to my executive producer and editor, Angie Vargos. I hope all of you are having a good holiday time here. I hope you have a good Christmas. I hope we have a better new year. Take care, everyone.